Hey folks, welcome to week nine of the Classroom Hatchery program. We have a full lineup today with an excellent presentation from Brooke Schreier from the Invasive Species Awareness Program, another great fishy fact from Johnny, and a bit of hatchery management that we have to do. So let's get started. We are learning about invasive species today. And there is a wide variety of philosophies, opinions, and ways of thinking, even amongst knowledgeable ecologists, when it comes to the topic of invasive species. And I think that this is a good thing. Like the diversity of living things, diversity of ecosystems, and diversity of culture, the diversity and evolution of opinions combined with healthy and respectful debate is important in the making of best practices and solutions. An invasive species is any organism, plant, animal, fungi, or microorganisms such as bacteria that is introduced by humans outside of its native range that causes harm to the environment, to the economy, or to human health. Invasive species can have devastating impacts. One example of this relates to American chestnut. American chestnut was a very important tree in eastern North America, including the southern part of Ontario. Fast growing, reaching up to 30 meters in height and 3 meters in diameter. A great, strong, workable and rot resistant building material and a huge producer of nuts. These nuts were valuable food sources for wildlife such as bear, deer, squirrels and many birds as well as for people. They were eaten raw or roasted, sold on the streets and fed to livestock. The tree also had some medicinal uses too. In 1904, not long after the last Lake Ontario Atlantic salmon swam in our waters, a fungal parasite called chestnut blight was discovered in New York City, believed to have arrived on some Asiatic chestnuts destined for fancy gardens. In July of that year, an American chestnut in a Bronx park turned fall color. Its leaves scorched and curled, and its bark swelled and was covered in rings of orange spots. Its wood became soft. Within a year, this tree was dead, and chestnut blight was sweeping across the country. In the four decades that followed, an estimated four billion American chestnut trees died from this disease. A huge loss to humans for building material, food, and income, and to many species of wildlife, and not just the ones I've already listed, but also to many invertebrate species. The loss of American beech correlates with the largest invertebrate extinction in modern times. And many of these invertebrates, especially the moth caterpillars, having evolved alongside this tree, eating its leaves, were very important food sources for birds, especially during nesting season. Similar stories are happening right now to butternut, American beech, oaks, ashes, and hemlocks from invasive species. And that is only the tree world. Many species of fish, herbaceous plants, invertebrates, mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles are all under threat by invasive species. And many native species have already been driven to extinction. I've worked a few contracts where invasive species monitoring and control were part of my job. I've worked in places where the entire understory of a forest was completely dominated by garlic mustard, an invasive plant native to Europe that was introduced to southern Ontario in the early 1800s as an edible herb. I've seen the same thing with dog strangling vine and European buckthorn, both introduced intentionally for use in gardens. I've recorded new population occurrences and increases in existing population sizes, pulled, cut, and applied nasty chemicals to invasive terrestrial plants. I want to share with you my personal and evolving opinion about invasive species. I don't think that we should hate them. I don't think that they're evil. I don't even think that they're bad. They have their place, their value, and their right to exist just like any other organism. They are not moving around with nefarious intentions to disrupt and destroy. 
They are moved to new places by humans and are just following their basic and original instructions to grow and reproduce. While organisms do migrate naturally, for example in the belly or on the feather of a bird blowing off course, and nature will balance itself from introductions, we humans are moving species at a very rapid rate, both intentionally by taking a species from one ecosystem and putting it into one where it had not previously occurred, and accidentally when it may hitch a ride on us, on our machines, or on our goods. Nature may take thousands or even hundreds of thousands of years to balance itself from an introduction, and we are constantly throwing new species into the mix. The concern I have with invasive species and why I have been involved with combating them is not out of hatred for them, but out of care for our native biodiversity. Native species have developed complex relationships with the native biodiversity surrounding them for millions of years. Invasive species often survive in a wide range of conditions, spread quickly, and lack the complex checks and balances of predators and disease that they have in their native range. Because of this, they often outcompete native species, and while they sometimes fulfill some of the ecological roles that the native species do, they are almost never as good at it. It's not that invasive species are bad, it's that they threaten native biodiversity. All right, a quick hatchery check. Filter's running. Aerator's working. Temperature is at six degrees. And again, no sign of any fish, which is a good sign. This one is good. All right, in this tank, filter's working. Lots of foam on the top. Aerator's working. And we're sitting just a touch over four degrees, so it's great. And our fish have almost all hatched. A couple of eggs left. So this tank, a bit behind the other one for hatching, as well as it's taking a little bit longer for these, these fish to hatch, these eggs to hatch and do elven. Just something that's noteworthy. This is something else. I'm going to show you something right now. So when we look at our tanks, you can see the water level has dropped. This is because of evaporation. The water in the warmer tank has evaporated faster than in the colder tank. We have a three degree difference and over the past two months, that has translated into about twice the evaporation in the warmer tank. The water level is not too low, but we don't want it to drop below the intake of the filter or it will start to suck up air and not function properly. We also do want the coils to be completely submerged so that the chiller is cooling water, not air. I have a bucket of clean well water sitting outside to cool down as I don't want to dramatically change the water temperature in the tank. I'll also add a bit of salt. The water evaporates and most of the salt stays in the tank, but some does get out and I want to make sure we have enough salt in the water to keep down any fungus. So I am going to go ahead and do this. It's not an exciting thing to watch, so I won't show you that part, but I really did want you to see how temperature influences evaporation of water. Let's hear from Brooke and then from Johnny. Hi folks, my name is Brooke Schreier and I work with the Ontario Federation of English and Hunters in the Invading Species Awareness Program. I was asked by Ben with, the, with our Atlantic Salmon Program to give you a quick little tour through what we do, our program, a little bit of career highlights around how I got to where I am today. So why don't we jump in and we can do that. So our program, uh, so I work with the Invading Species Awareness Program, as I said, and fundamentally our, our role within the province has always been to 
facilitate education and outreach related to invasive species. And you might even recognize the invasive species in this uh, cover page, which is the silver carp. Um, this is one of the four Asian carps, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in just a little bit. So what are we going to talk about in the next 15 to 20 minutes? Well, we're going to talk about who we are and we're going to talk about what we do. And then I'm going to get into some aquatic invasive species that could really fundamentally affect the ability of the Atlantic salmon to really reestablish itself within Ontario's waters. And then finally, we're going to go over reporting. So what you can do as individuals when you're out on our landscape, you know, during these, these uncertain times, a lot of us are really enjoying the outdoors, getting out, going for hikes, doing some gardening, and oftentimes you may encounter invasive species. So I'm gonna highlight what you can do when you encounter those. So as a quick introduction for myself, um, you know, I am the aquatic program specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program. Uh, ever since I was a little kid, I love being on the water, as you can see, uh, first photo of me uh, on a boat, driving the boat. And so the water and our natural resources and our environments has always held uh, a near and dear place to my heart. And I've, I always knew that I wanted to pursue a career in the environmental field. I didn't necessarily know what that looked like when I was younger. Um, it was, you know, obviously daunting when you're a younger individual, you're going through high school, you're really discovering who you are as a person. And then wanting to then transform that into a career in such a short period of time uh, through, you know, choosing your post-secondary education can be very challenging, right? I think we all go through that. And I was very fortunate to grow up in a family who, who hunted and who really enjoyed the outdoors, who taught me all about life processes and, and the importance of our natural resources. And as a result of that, it kind of directed me towards um, the environmental field, right? And again, I didn't really know necessarily what capacity I wanted to, to work in the field. Um, I actually applied to become a, a conservation officer at Fleming College. Um, I also applied to Ottawa University for environmental law. And then I finally applied to Trent University for environmental studies. And I actually pursued Trent University. Uh, it was uh, a school that my sister had attended and I actually got to go to a lot of classes when I was about 12 years old. So I really, I really loved the school. So I had, you know, some form of roots there. So I decided to, to pursue that. And I was fortunate to get in, uh, to be accepted to Trent University and then was there for about four or five years. I, I unfortunately lost a year due to, uh, to illness, but was able to complete my environmental studies degree. And then following that, I actually pursued a master's in sustainability studies. So I grew up loving the outdoors and hunting so much that I actually said, hey, I actually wanna dedicate a master's degree to focusing on the ethics and sustainability of hunting in Ontario. You know, I'm, I'm an avid deer hunter, bear hunter, um, you know, you name it, I've, I've tried it. And so I decided, hey, like, why not do that? It was a really uh, interesting experience. It was, it was great meeting new people, really diversifying the way I, I, I saw the world and the lenses with which I looked at hunting through. And so it really opened my eyes. And, you know, I was very fortunate to have an organization like the Ontario Federation of Anglican Hunters just in my back my backyard, uh, you know, not literally, but they, you know, we're very close by. And I decided, hey, why not uh, throw my name in the hat and see if I can potentially get a, get a job there. And sure enough, um, in my final year of my master's degree, I was very fortunate to acquire uh, the Aquatic Invasive Species at Reach Liaison role. And then I've been with the OFH now for, for over five years. And in those five years, I've kind of moved around a bit within ISAP. I've been the monitoring and information management specialist. I've been an aquatic program specialist like I am now. And I've even you know, helped out uh, the program in, in many different capacities um, like the ones I just mentioned. So it's really been a, an awesome enlightening experience. And I've, I've really enjoyed my time with UFAH and continue to enjoy my, uh, my time with UFAH. So you know, here's to, here's to five more years. That being said, you know, in my role, I get to do all sorts of cool things like engage with the media, as you'll see in the, in the center photo there. Um, actually, ironically enough, I have uh, Mr. Grasscart, that same jar right here, because uh, I figured I'd show you guys uh, a few of the fish and, and what we're dealing with and what we're trying to keep at bay from getting into our Great Lakes. And then, you know, another example of an Asian carp on the far right there are the silver carp, the ones that you saw on the first slide. Those are the ones that, you know, leap out of water and when they're disturbed, uh, very dangerous fish, one that we don't want in Ontario's waters. And we're very fortunate right now to not have those in our waters. So before we really dive into, you know, the meat and potatoes, as it were, of this presentation, I figured we should go over some, some key definitions, right? 
So when you're talking about invasive species, there's kind of three terms that come up, alien species, aquatic invasive species, and terrestrial invasive species. As you can imagine, alien species is kind of synonymous with introduced or non-native species, depending on who you talk to, but I usually use them uh, synonymously. So they all kind of mean the same thing. And what, that, what they are, are species that were actually most of the time introduced by human action. And they've been introduced outside of their natural past or present distribution, but aren't having the same detrimental impacts to our environments or our economy or you know, society as invasive species do. So these are the species that are here that shouldn't be here, but aren't having the same negative consequences, right? An example we have down uh, there is the Chinook salmon, which is not native to the Great Lakes. Then you differentiate that with invasive species as, you know, in terms of aquatic invasive species, we're talking about, you know, those fish, those animals, those uh, invertebrates and pathogens that exist in our waters, which were introduced most of the time by humans. And these are, you know, introduced outside of their, their known distribution. And these are the ones, like I said, that are having those harmful consequences. They're, they're affecting our environments. They're affecting our native species. They're affecting our food processes. Uh, our food webs, or potentially even of impacting our ability as humans to really enjoy our natural resources. So an example um, in the center bottom there is actually a round goby, which is uh, you know, an invasive fish that was introduced from the Caspian and Black Sea regions of, of Eurasia uh, back in the you know, 90s and has now become quite well established throughout the Great Lakes and in many uh, inland lakes in Southern Ontario. Then to differentiate that once more with terrestrial invasive species, we're talking about those trees, shrubs, or herbaceous plants um, that are outside of their known distribution, very similar to AIS or aquatic invaders, but these ones are actually terrestrial in nature, right? So we're talking about plants, we're talking about insects, we're talking about forest pathogens and, and things that really affect our, our plant life and um, you know, our, our ecosystems that are terrestrial in nature. And an example of that on the bottom right is actually Japanese knotweed, which is a nasty uh, invasive shrub that was introduced um, from Japan some time ago. So now that we have a, a good definition of what we're talking about, what are invasive species, so now I'm going to lead you down the path of, okay, so why do we do what we do and who are we? So the Invasive Species Awareness Program was actually a partnership program that was created in 1992 between the OFAH, uh, so the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Now, the reason why it was created in 1992 was fundamentally because of zebra mussels, which we're going to talk about. So zebra mussels, uh, which is a nasty little invasive bivalve, um, also from the same region as Eurasia as the Round Gobi, was introduced via ballast water. And if you don't know what ballast water is, it's essentially the water in the bottom of a seafaring vessel that they put in there in order to ensure stability when they're crossing oceans and similar water bodies. Because obviously, you know, as large waves go back and forth, if you didn't have ballast water, the, the, the ships would tip over, right? So that's, that ballast water ensures that, that that vessel can remain, you know, uh, level on that water as it's crossing the ocean. So it's, it's safe. Unfortunately, it has proven to be quite the vector of spread um, for many of these invasive species over the years. Now, it is well managed now, but back in the day before it was managed, you had a lot of AIS or aquatic invasive species, which were introduced to the Great Lakes by ballast water, and zebra mussels were one of those. They were actually introduced in the late 80s, early 90s to Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River, and then have since kind of spread throughout the Great Lakes as well as inland by pathways such as boats and anglers and bait buckets and things like that. Anytime you have standing water, you have the risk of, of spreading something like zebra mussels. So as a program, we actually focus on trying to address these key pathways of introduction and spread through various programs that we have, right? So what we're trying to do is educate Ontario's public about, hey, you know, as a boater, when you're coming off the water, you're a potential pathway of spread for invasive species. Beyond that, we also facilitate monitoring and early detection of uh, species that we have as well as species that we don't have, right? So we, we monitor for about 189 species across the province, and we um, participate in early detection of many species. So for example, if something's reported to us, which is not found in Ontario, we might have caught it early enough that between the OFAH and partners that are involved in the fight against invasive species can respond quickly, uh, do what we need to do to you know, remove or eradicate that, that plant or uh, insect or fish, 
before it really has a chance to establish itself. Because once an invasive species has a chance to establish itself, that's when you're, you're in real trouble and it becomes very costly at that time. Then finally, we also su support surveillance, control, and response. Um, specifically, water soldier is a very nasty aquatic invasive plant, which was found in the Trent Severn Waterway in 2008. We have a very, um, we're very fortunate to have Robert McGowan, who is our management technician within ISAP, who works year after year surveying for this plant, mapping this plant, and then helping partners, uh, a number of partners, uh, work towards eradicating this plant in uh, Southern Ontario. And it's actually been very successful. It's a great, great project. And then finally, Asian carps, you know, the four Asian carp species, which we do not yet have in Ontario. And again, I'll touch on that, but uh, we really do facilitate early detection for Asian carps in Ontario's waters. So who's the team? Well, top left, we have Alison Morris, who is, you know, unfortunately uh, is not with us right now. She's actually on maternity leave. So fortunately and unfortunately, um, I, I, we're, we'll be happy to have her back hopefully in the next few months. And then we have Sophie in the middle, who's our coordinator. She's the one who makes sure that we all have jobs and that we, we continue to work. We continue to, to combat uh, the invasive species in Ontario. And then if I can move my little screen here, we can see Robert, the one that I, that I mentioned before, who is our management technician who works on Water Soldier. Bottom left, we have Chase, who's you know, planting some plants with another conservation program that we have at uh, the OFH, which is Alice or Alternative Land Use Services. Um, so he got to get out of the office for the day because he's our communications uh, liaison. So he's usually behind the computer. So he was very happy to get out that day, as you can tell by the smile on his face. And then uh, I already introduced myself, but in the bottom right, uh, you have me. And the, I'd be remiss not to mention the three individuals who are not on this slide, which is Riley, Matthew, and Jordan, who are all new additions to the team who have really helped us get through some of the really cumbersome, busy times of the year over the last you know, uh, three to six months, I would say. So in terms of pathways, the, the types of pathways that we focus on with our messaging are essentially anything. You know, if you're on the landscape, you have the risk of spreading invasive species. So whether it's four wheeling or, or trail hiking or uh, boating or angling or the, like, you know, being a, an avid uh, you know, gardener and, and going to horticultural centers and buying plants, or even being a waterfowl hunter, um, no matter what you're doing on the landscape, there's a potential of spread. And those are the types of people that we try to engage with to educate them about all the different species that we don't want in Ontario's waters. This is you know, some of the education outreach that you could normally see from us, um, especially in a non-COVID year. We would be at trade shows, um, engaging with Ontario's public face-to-face. -face. We'd be at presentations for lake associations, cottage associations. We'll be doing in-class presentations. Uh, but now we've had to adapt uh, virtually to a lot of this to ensure our safety and the safety of those who want to learn about invasive species. So it's been very successful and we've been able to really do a lot of great virtual work, um, really spearheaded by a lot of our social media. As you can see on the far right there, we have all sorts of different varieties of social media posts that um, really raise the profile for invasive species in Ontario, such as the grass carp. So now that you have a, a landscape of kind of what we do, I wanna now switch over to, okay, so in addition to what we do, but can we also talk about how people like you can report invasive species in Ontario? And there's three means, uh, three, primary means with which you can do that. So there's the invading species hotline, which is 1-800-563-7711 and has been active since the, the start of the program in 1992. Uh, we receive over a thousand phone calls every year of people who are just inquiring about invasive species or reporting invasive species. Uh, like I mentioned with the early detection work, that really facilitates a lot of that early detection. EdMaps Ontario, which stands for the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System. And this was a program that was actually created by the University of Georgia and was then adapted for Ontario in 2014. To date, we have over 54,000 invasive species reports in, in that program. And it also works as a means to detect early uh, invasive species that aren't supposed to be here. Then finally, we have our iNaturalist project, which is a relatively new program that we started using. We created this pro project in January of 2018, but already we have almost 70,000 invasive species re reports. And now you might be wondering, well, why use all these different programs? And fundamentally, what it's supposed to do is give us a better picture, a better landscape of invasive, spe invasive species in Ontario, because no one program has every single person reporting, right? You have a lot of people who might use EdMaps, you have a lot of people who might use iNaturalist. So it's really important that we diversify to ensure that we're getting 
a full landscape of where these things are in our province. So when people report, this is what it looks like. So when somebody reports what they suspect is a grass carp, and here's an example of a grass carp right here. This is a mold, not a real one, even though it looks relatively real. So this is a, one of the four Asian carp species. And this uh, photo here was actually from a report um, back in 2017 when an individual called the invading species hotline and said, hey, I think I caught a grass carp. Sure enough, we communicated with our partners at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. And within a few days, you know, they were out on the water electrofishing for that invasive fish and they, they removed uh, 10 specimens that day. So it really shows you that, you know, somebody like you can make a difference by reporting an invasive species because then it comes to us and then we'll facilitate getting that information to partners such as DFO or MNRF and they'll go out uh, in some circumstances like with Asian carps and ensure that those things are taken out of our waters. So let's jump into a few different profiles around species that can really impact uh, Atlantic salmon and their ability to really develop a, a strong reproducing population. So, you know, with Atlantic salmon and any salmon species, they really do prefer cooler, you know, fast flowing waters. Well, what are some things that really disrupt that? Eurasian water milfoil. So Eurasian water milfoil is an invasive aquatic plant that was first detected in Lake Erie in 1961 and was again a ballast water introduction that I mentioned before. So it, it got in again through, the, through that ballast water. And what it does is it just really stagnates water, right? It reproduces very quickly. Uh, in small fragments of about six inches can establish new populations. Um, they can be broken off and reroute themselves and they'll really slow down water bodies. They'll create stagnant waters. And when you get stagnant waters, you get warmer waters. So those are things that you know, will both um, fundamentally affect the ability of Atlantic salmon, for example, to, to exist and to thrive and to reproduce. So when we talk about Eurasian water milfoil, we always differentiate it from our northern milfoil because though you know, uh, a large abundance of aquatic plants is bad, we still want some diversity, right? This, this, this structure of our ecosystems is very important. So we, we need native aquatic plant life, but we don't want too much invasive aquatic plant life, right? So the northern water milfoil, the way we differentiate between these two species is actually very specific. It all has to do with the number of leaflets on a leaf. So if you look at the one on the left there, you see that there's, there's threads over to the right and there's threads over to the left. So if you count those, those threads or those bracts, if there's 12 or more, you have Eurasian water milfoil. If there's less than 12, you have northern water milfoil. So that's a quick and dirty way of differentiating between the native and the invasive species. This is a map from the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, so EDMAPS, and it really shows you how extensive this population is in Ontario. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't quite show how um, widespread it is, just given the nature of the map. But if you look in Southern Ontario, that 181 is actually spread over a large area. So it's, it's quite well established in Southern Ontario, as well as many other water, water bodies in Ontario that may not be represented on this map. Zebra mussels. We all know about zebra mussels. These, these guys were really, um, they really ep epitomize um, invasive species in Ontario, right? And what are they? Well, they're, they're small freshwater mussels. They're called bivalves. And like I said, they're native to the Eurasian region. We're introduced via ballast water, but then spread all throughout the province via our recreational gear and boats, right? And unfortunately, they have a larval stage where they're actually microscopic and you can't see them. So any standing water that's in a vessel or similar device could actually spread this invasive species. They have a broad range of habitats, except one real limit, lim, limiting factor is actually calcium uh, concentrations. So if there's not enough calcium in a water body, they can't develop their shells. And if they can't develop their shells, well, you don't have adult zebra mussels. These are the types of images that we're all too familiar with, whether it's the, the boat that's completely covered in zebra mussels or the water intake pipes, which have been um, you know, fouled. These suckers will always find a way to disrupt our lives as long as they're here in Southern Ontario. And in, in addition to cutting our feet and creating dense stands on rocks and boats and docks, um, they also like to filter feed, right? So a single zebra mussel can actually filter about a liter of water per day of it, a plankton. And plankton is, you know, the base of the food chain for our species, which would be fundamentally important for things like Atlantic salmon. 
Not only that, but when you have this filtering behavior, it actually clears up the water body. And by clearing up the water body, you're increasing sunlight penetration. And well, what happens when you have greater sunlight penetration? You have warmer waters, which again affects the ability of something like the Atlantic salmon to thrive and uh, establish a, a reproducing population. Here's its current distribution in, in Ontario, quite widespread through the Great Lakes, like I mentioned before, in southern Ontario. So finally, let's uh, jump into the Asian carps. So I've shown you a few, you know, I've shown you a few Asian carps already. The grass carp is really the most imminent threat to our waters. We're very fortunate not to have any established populations in Ontario's waters. And I also want to make sure that you guys know that when we're talking about Asian carps, we're not talking about common carp, so Cyprinus carpio. This is actually a non-native species which has invasive tendencies depending on where it's introduced, but is not one of the four Asian carps that we're talking about. So the four that we're talking about in the top left is big head carp and then silver carp to the right. You have grass carp, again, that most imminent threat, right? This guy right here. And then you have black carp in the bottom right. So all of these species were introduced to uh, the states in the 1960s and 70s. And then unfortunately there was a flooding event. They got out into the Mississippi River Basin, began reproducing and spreading north. These things really are disruptors to the environments in which they invade. They make up a huge proportion of the biomass. They completely outcompete native species uh, for food, you know, uh, resources like um, space. And um, so they'll, they'll really create a very large footprint once they've invaded. We're, again, we're very fortunate that we don't have any of these in Ontario yet. So we want to we want to keep it that way. So again, if you think you've seen an Asian carp, make sure you report uh, any potential sighting. But the good news is, is there are three electrical barriers currently in the Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal, which keep these species at bay by pumping electricity into the water so that they cannot get out of the Mississippi and Illinois watersheds into Lake Michigan and the rest of the Great Lakes. So again, going back to the importance of reporting, if you suspect that you've encountered an invasive species, whether terrestrial or aquatic, make sure you give us a call, 1-800-563-7711, Monday to Friday, nine to five. We'll be more than happy to answer your questions, provide you with resources, facilitate getting photos from you so that we can put a report into EdMaps. Um, as well as, you know, if you don't want to give us a call, you can actually shoot us an email at info at invadingspecies.com. You can create an EdMaps profile by going to www.eddmaps.org slash Ontario, or you can join our iNaturalist project by going to the iNaturalist uh, webpage and searching for invasive species in Ontario. So with that, I'd like to say thank you. I'd like to thank Ben for giving me the opportunity to chat with you folks today. And Feel free to get in touch. If you want to send me an email, my email is right there, brook underscore schreier at ofah.org. If you have questions about invasive species or aquatic invasive species or uh, some of our programming or you just want some resources, feel free to get in touch. I'm always happy to talk with folks. With that, I'd like to say thanks again. Uh, it's been a blast. Hello, everyone. Thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're going to talk about a voracious predatory fish species, the northern snakehead. Northern snakehead are native to China, Russia, North Korea, and South Korea. They have been introduced to parts of the United States where they are considered an invasive species. Northern snakehead can reach lengths of about 85 centimeters and weigh up to 15 pounds. They have torpedo shaped bodies and a single long dorsal fin. Their heads are somewhat flattened and their bodies are brownish in color with dark blotches. Northern snakehead have a reputation for being formidable predators. They have sharp teeth which they use to consume their prey which consists of fish, invertebrates, reptiles and amphibians and even birds and mammals. They can walk short distances along land by wiggling their bodies. Northern snakehead also possess a lung-like organ, which allows them to absorb oxygen by gulping air while on land or from the water's surface. This allows them to survive out of water for up to four days. And because of their ability to absorb oxygen from the air, Snakehead can thrive in waters with low levels of dissolved oxygen. 
northern snakehead are found in a variety of habitats, including ponds, lakes, rivers, and streams, and they can tolerate water temperatures between 0 and 30 degrees Celsius. The Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, along with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, have partnered together to create Ontario's Invading Species Awareness Program. Although the northern snakehead has yet to be detected in Ontario waters, they pose a potential threat to Ontario's biodiversity. The snakehead's ability to thrive in a variety of habitat conditions would allow it to easily spread through the Great Lakes watersheds. And because of their voracious feeding habits, they would likely outcompete native species for food. The northern snakehead can reach lengths over 50 centimeters in just two short years, and they would quickly become too long for some of our native predators like muscalunge, northern pike, and largemouth bass. The northern snakehead has a similar appearance to two of Ontario's native species, and it is important to know how to distinguish between these species. This is a bowfin, so let's figure out how to distinguish the bowfin from the snakehead. First, bowfin have this real prominent spot on the caudal peduncle, right before the tail fin. They also have a hard bony plate under their jaw, which they use for crushing snails. Bowfin also lack the long anal fin that northern snakehead have, and instead have a much smaller anal fin. This is a burbot and burbot have very small scales compared to the snakehead's much larger scales. Burbot also have a single chin barbel and two dorsal fins, a short one followed by a much longer one. Northern snakehead lack the chin barbel and they possess only one long dorsal fin. If you suspect that you have found a northern snakehead in Ontario, you can report it by phoning the Invading Species Hotline or online at the EdMaps website or by downloading the EdMaps Ontario application onto your tablet or smart device. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the northern snakehead in this week's segment of Fishy Facts. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you, Brooke and Johnny, for those great presentations. So what can you do to help protect Ontario's native biodiversity from the threats of invasive species? You should learn about the invasive species in your area so that you can minimize the chance that you spread them around on your clothing, boots, ATV, or boat. Don't plant invasive species in your yard. Sadly, there are lots available from many garden centers. Don't dump garden waste into natural areas. Don't dump your aquarium in waterways which may introduce invasive fish or invasive aquatic plants. Learn to identify the invasive species so that you can report them through the hotline. And my last ask of you is that if you have a garden or access to a garden, plant native species which support native biodiversity. Thanks for watching and check out next week when we are going to be learning about the four pillars of the Lake Ontario Atlantic Salmon Restoration Program.